I'm Kate Wigworth from the Australian Institute of International Affairs. I'm here this evening with Dr John Blacksland, a Senior Fellow at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. We're here this evening to discuss his new book, The Australian Army from Whitlam to Howard. Thank you for coming this evening. My pleasure, Kate. Um, I might start off with asking you what is the core message of your book and what inspired you to write it? Uh, the core message of the book is that the Australian Army is little understood in the post-Vietnam War years. Um, and if you think about Australia's military history, our understanding of who we are as a nation, a lot of it is influenced by Gallipoli, the First World War, the Second World War, even the Vietnam War. There's quite a high level of understanding and consciousness of those conflicts. And yet the Australian Army and the Australian Defence Force have been involved in operations, uh, about 150 operations, in the, in the 35 to 40 years sub subsequently mm -hmm. that are little known about, little understood, little reported on. And so I really felt there was a need to, to address that. And I tried to pull together the, the spectrum of operations over all those years and to provide a narrative to try and give it some meaning, if you like. Yeah, definitely. Um, has your research given you any surprises or further insights that you perhaps didn't learn through your experiences as a soldier in the Australian Army? Well, it's very much informed by my experience. Um, and of course, I, I lived through a lot of it. Um, and so I was telling a bit of my own story indirectly, although it's not written in the first person. But it's, a lot of it's about my experience, but it's, it's complemented by reflections from participants along the way, from General Gratian, General Peter Lay, uh, various other players along the way who, who I spoke to, corresponded with, engaged with on various aspects of their experience, their reflections, their understanding of what happened, how it happened and why it happened. And then I pulled all that together and I added some uh, material that, I, that I, uh, I was able to uncover from uh, newspapers and from correspondence with other people, from open, open source reports. None of it's classified, it's all from unclassified sources. Pulled it all together and told a story that uh, was more than just a uh, an autobiographical account because I don't feature in the book uh, yeah. directly, but it, it, it's kind of uh, it, it tells the story of what was happening around me, if you like. Yeah, there did seem to be a big emphasis on World War One and World War Two, and that there's been a lot of a lot written about that, but mm. not so much on like like your book does from from Whitlam to Howard. And how have you found your transition from being part of the part of the Australian Army mm. to becoming an academic? Has that been an easy transition? Well, I, I, uh, I was dabbling in that uh, space for quite some time. I wrote uh, a couple of books beforehand while I was in the Army, so I always was very interested in, in academia, in writing history, in reflecting on the meaning of, if you like, of, of experience. Um, and so, actually, the transition for me personally was very easy. Uh, it was a very comfortable one. Um, but it was, I got added impetus from my colleagues at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre who really provided me some extra uh, insights, some really helpful perspectives that were complementary to my own understanding. And that really helped me uh, get a, a, a slightly more elevated perspective, if you like, on, on what the Army was doing and what it meant. Uh, and I think that uh, comes through in the storytelling, if you like. Uh, which is what history is, after all. Yeah. But it's it's a, it's a, it's an account that reflects. I, I try. I'm not trying to do this in as dispassionate way as I can. Reflecting on what the army did, why it did it, and so what. Yeah. Um, in your book, you've written about how um, how important training has been into creating the prowess of the Australian soldier. Um, you also discuss the expectation for increased humanitarian assistance and disaster response of the Australian Army um, in our region. Um, do you think training uh, in the Australian Army sufficiently prepares uh, soldiers and commanders to respond to these evolving demands um, of what typically has just been uh, focused on warfare, like um, uh, uh, soldiers compete, uh, performing in combat scenarios? Yeah, well I think uh, the bottom line is that armies prepare for war. Uh, and that's the, the, the nub of the, the matter. You've got to, uh, armies need to be able to conduct war fighting. Uh, and that's a pretty nasty and brutish sort of uh, uh, occupation and activity. But short of that, there's a whole spectrum of activities 
that the Army can be employed in um, that utilise a, a range of skills that go to building up the capability for warfighting, be it engineering skills, be it uh, team activities, communications, medical uh, assistance, transportation, reconstruction. There's a range of activities that, that go to making an army proficient at warfighting skills that don't necessarily require you to go down that path that can be used for, for good, if you like, for non-violent non uh, ac activities. And this is something that the Australian Army is really good at. Um, and so that activity has been fed into the training continuum uh, in, a, in the Australian Army's context. And it really makes for quite a remarkable army uh, because it's an army that is, sure, it's, it trains for warfighting, but it does a range of other activities in its, uh, in its, and it takes it in its stride. Um, this leads me to um, my next question. You uh, have previously mentioned that uh, the Australian Army is comparatively small in the region. It's mm. consisting of about 30,000 troops, whereas Indonesia has 340,000, give or take. Mm. Um, do, do you think this has shaped political decisions in terms of when to deploy Australian, Australian ground forces and the types of deployments that they do? Yeah, and no, without question, that's the case. Uh, Essentially, one of the things, and I argue this in the book, is that there's a, a casualty cringe, if you like, uh, yeah. developed from the Vietnam War experience. The searing effect of, of casualties, of political uh, fallout from things not going the way they'd hoped in Vietnam, and from having a small force that uh, the government back in the mid-1960s felt the only way to grow was through conscription. Since then, governments have studiously avoided uh, generating a, a requirement for an army to be deployed that would require conscription. So, as a consequence, carefully calibrated niche contributions have been the flavour, if you like, of what governments have been prepared to offer to international contributions around the world, be it for uh, operations in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia or in Africa or elsewhere in the Pacific. Very carefully calibrated contributions of highly skilled, uh, very well equipped uh, men and women to go and conduct specific operations for specific time frames um, with a, very much in mind the political uh, domestic consequences in mind and that's understandable. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, how have the expectations of the Australian Army changed between the Cold War and the post 9-11 era and what expectations do you see arising for the Army in what has been dubbed the Asian century? Well, um, it's interesting, you know, as the Cold War ended, the Australian Army and the Defence Force got involved in a whole spectrum of activities that it just hadn't anticipated in the years prior to that, from operations in Somalia, in Rwanda, in Cambodia, in Bougainville, um, in East Timor. There's so many activities that, would, that caught us almost on the hop and taught us a whole range of lessons that we actually took quite a while to learn, in fact. But we did get to learn a lot of them. Um, and then 9-11 comes along and it, it actually changed the dynamics quite significantly. We then started thinking much more about war fighting, mm. um, not just about peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance. Um, that kind of work still uh, came into the scene quite a lot with the Aceh uh, tsunami consequences and various other problems in, in the Solomon Islands and, and the like. But war fighting uh, came, came into the picture, certainly counterinsurgency war fighting. Uh, was very much has been the flavour, if you like, for the last decade or more. But as we come out of Afghanistan, it's important to reflect on what has gone before and what might happen in the future, and reflect on the kind of capabilities that the army needs to have, the kind of operations it conceivably could get involved in, uh, and how to try and shape the environment in a constructive way, so that the, the prospects of war are reduced somehow. Well, thank you very much for joining us here tonight and thank you for discussing your book and your thoughts on the Australian Army.